And uh, I want to introduce uh, Ed Martin here, who became interested in uh, in the uh, contacts, and he was interested more in a statement that was made someplace in the contacts there in the, the material that we published that Jesus survived the crucifixion and went to Damascus and from Damascus worked his way across Asia Minor. Yeah, okay. And uh, that, that he joined Judas Iscariot who had gone to, to uh, Damascus. And the argument they offered Meyer was that Judas didn't die at the scene. He didn't commit suicide. That the one that was... That w was found hanging in a tree in the garden of the of the temple was Judah Iherias. Note the similarity in names. Judah Iherias. That was he was priest Iherias' son, who was the high priest of the temple there, and it was a mortal sin for them to commit suicide. And as soon as the temple attendants found who it was, they cut him down immediately, took him inside, and they put out the word that it was Judas Iscariot who had hung himself, and that he had been taken away for burial. Well, Judas Iscariot apparently uh, escaped uh, after the crucifixion, and he knew that Jesus was going to Damascus, and he was already had already left. He was on his way there. That's why he wasn't at the Last Supper. All this was being told. Myron, and it's quite a departure from our Orthodox uh, uh, New Testament stories. Now, Jim Deardorff, that follows Ed Martin after this, is going to go into that in considerable detail. D Jim was a staunch Christian believer and he was disturbed about what the Pleiades were saying and he decided to look into it himself and he went to great pains to buy and obtain copies of all of the New Testament versions. He found that there was substantial difference in the translations and he wrote, he, he continued his study, he wrote a whole book on the differences he found in the, the, the stories translated and passed down to us as our Christian Bible. And I'm going to leave that for Jim to tell you about after Ed Martin, but Ed Martin is going to describe his investigation of the survival, the possible survival of Jesus Christ after the crucifixion. So with that, I'm out of time, and I thank you for your attention, and is Ed Martin ready back there? <laughs> Once again, here's the latest book on the Pleiades Contacts by Guido Musburger, and they've got it on a table back here, Michael Whelan's table. Title. Uh, the title is, And Yet They Fly. This is a con reports a continuation of the contacts after we stop publishing. Okay, go ahead. So uh, with that, Ed Martin, Young Traveler. recognize and salute the divinity within you. I thought I'd mention briefly about this piece of music that was just playing in the months before I started to write my book. I had a series of vivid dreams, and in those vivid dreams, I was meeting with my spirit guide on the other side. It's a wonderful gentleman with a, a turban, white beard, blue eyes, and one of the things he mentioned to me as we had our discussions, he said, every time you give a talk about the subject of Jesus in India, play that piece of music, which is Paco Bell's Canon in D major. One time when I was speaking at a Unity Church, I've spoken at a number of Unity Churches, that uh, the lady who was helping me the time before, she put the music cassette in a, the wrong box. So I showed up and didn't have that piece of music. And, and I said, oh my goodness, I don't have the music that I always play. The music director there at the church, who had never heard me speak, didn't know anything about, about this, she said, oh, don't worry, I've selected a piece of music for you. I said, great. Anything you select will be great. We're up there on the, on the podium, and the service was going on, and they started the music, and guess what it was? Paco Belt's Canon in D major. And I said, okay, okay, I believe. I'm so happy I started crying. I uh, thought I'd mention, I want to say thank you to Bob and Terry Brown and the Board of Directors. They do a wonderful job with the UFO Congress. Every time they do a wonderful job, they work very hard. And just thought I'd, I'd mention that. I want to say thanks to them.
my birthday is two days before Christmas. I thought I'd just briefly show you something about, uh, we can start the slides. We'll go ahead and I'll show you, uh, yes, can we see that one? This is, oh, does the top come down? A weird UFO joke for your birthday, close encounter of the turd kind. Can you read that? <laughs> this is from Astronaut Humor. And here we go, starts out, I wonder if we can get the top to come down a little bit on the slides. Maybe we can tilt the projector down just a tad. There we go. Uh, happy birthday, so you think you've heard it all. Well, here's one I bet you haven't heard. Two Martians landed in the desert. They got out of their spaceship and looked around for signs of life. All they saw was an empty gas station with a big red gas pump. So the head Martian waddled over to the gas pump. Mi umpa, he said, who are you? There was no answer. Who is your leader, he asked. No answer. Where are we located, he asked. Still no answer. So he waddled back to the ship. What did he say, he asked breathlessly. He didn't say anything, said the head Martian. He just stood there with his penis in his ear. The title of my book, King of Travelers, I traveled in a lot of foreign countries. I was in about 49 foreign countries on six continents through the years. It was really important to me to travel and especially to go to India. I've been twice to India so far. And the title of my book, King of Travelers, Jesus Lost Years in India, it comes from a uh, conversation that I had when I was teaching in Saudi Arabia some years ago. And what happened was that I was talking with some Muslim scholars, very learned gentlemen, and they were telling me about a, a great Muslim traveler who lived in the 1300s named Ibn Battuta. And Ibn Battuta was from Tunisia. He traveled for about 30 years. He traveled from Tunisia to Egypt to Arabia to India to China. And he came back home finally to Tunisia. And the story was that he was on his deathbed there in, in Tunisia and some admirers came to him. And the admirers gathered around his deathbed and they said, you, Ibn Battuta, are the greatest of all travelers. And the story was that he sat up in his deathbed and he smiled and he shook his finger and he said, no. He said, if you learn the truth about Jesus, Hazrat Isa, Isa, Prophet Jesus, if you learn the truth about the life of Jesus, Jesus is king of travelers. And the phrase kind of stuck in my mind, king of travelers. And I knew that the, the Holy Quran of the Muslims refers to Jesus as the chief of travelers and the great traveler. Uh, when I was a teenager, when I was, I believed in reincarnation since my early teens, it made sense to me. Let's see, we got the focus on this one. And that um, Edgar Casey, I found out about Edgar Casey when I was 18 years old. I met a young man from Hopkinsville, Kentucky, who told me about uh, Edgar Casey and Edgar Casey's wonderful work uh, that um, giving readings. Uh, medical readings and then later life readings about uh, concerning past lives. There were numerous times that Casey mentioned that Jesus had lived for years in India, especially those teenage years in the early 20s, that much of that time was spent in, in India. So that was the first place that really got me thinking about Jesus in India. And I have a great regard for the Casey material. By the way, that book there, um, The Story of Edgar, Edgar Casey, There is a River by Thomas Segrew. It's a wonderful book. And then I found this book also as a teenager, The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ by Levi Dowling. Levi Dowling was a Civil War chaplain in the Union Army, and as I understand, he was a very spiritual, very dedicated individual. In the years after the Civil War, that Levi Dowling found that he could go into a deep trance state, he could contact the Akashic Records. That's the same place that Edgar Cayce could contact the Akashic Records, the Hindus, that's a Hindu term, the Akashic Records are a, a record of every thought, word, and deed that has ever taken place on the earth plane. And it's kind of like a great cosmic tape recorder playing that records everything. And so Levi Dowling wrote this book, and a great part, a big part of this book, tells about, specifically, about young Jesus in India. How that he had a, a sponsor from uh, East India, from uh, the state of Orissa in Eastern India, uh, named Prince Ravana, and he, Prince Ravana was his patron. 
and it names specifically places that we'll see more of later, such as the Jagannath Temple in eastern India, the cities of Puri and Kuttak, uh, Benares, and other places. Afghanistan. What happened was that when I was going to school at the University of Alaska at Fairbanks, that I, the interest about going to India was really building up in me. So in my um, senior year, beginning of the senior year, that I volunteered for the Peace Corps. And I figured that was maybe the only way I'd be able to get to go to India. I wanted to go in the Peace Corps to India. They didn't have any opening right then for, for my area. So that what they, what they offered, they said, would you like to go in the Peace Corps to Afghanistan? I didn't know anything about Afghanistan. But um, I said, sure. They said, that's close to India. When you get vacation time, you'll be able to go to India. This, by the way, is a wonderful picture book by Roland and Sabrina Michaud from uh, France. Fantastic picture book. How can I tell you about Afghanistan? Afghanistan is like going back hundreds of years in time to a, a vastly different place. Afghanistan is, is a, an amazing place. Uh, some people call it very backwards, very primitive. And it was in Afghanistan, this is in, uh, this is in India, uh, this is the courtyard of the Golden Temple of the Sikhs, this is uh, Mount Everest up in Nepal, this is a place in Afghanistan called Bandi Amir, the Dam of the Saint, it's a natural mineral deposit around this, this huge spring that's become a huge lake. This is, this is uh, in Srinagar in Kashmir, northwestern India. What happened was that, that just about three days before I left to go to the Peace Corps, I was back in my hometown of Lampasas, Texas, and what had happened, I had charted out in my mind places I wanted to go to in India, mostly in North India. And I knew that in the Levi Dowling book, The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, I knew that it was mentioned that um, one of the places where Jesus had spent some time was in um, uh, Srinagar in Kashmir. Uh, and other areas in, in Kashmir. And so that was kind of on the back burner. I thought, well, maybe, maybe I'll go there, maybe I won't. What happened was that my mother happened to be at a fabric shop, to go to a fabric shop, and she saw someone that she had gone to high school with, a man that she had not seen since high school. And so that man and his wife were there. My mother buckled up her courage, and she walked over, and she said, are you so-and-so? And he said, yes, Dorothy, how you doing? And what happened was that my mother mentioned, she said, oh, by the way, my, yeah, my younger son is just about to uh, go in the Peace Corps. He's going to go to Afghanistan, and he's going there because he's crazy about going to India. And, and the man really lit up, and he said that he had spent his career in the State Department, and uh, in most of his career, he was stationed in India. And he said, where is your son now? And my mother said, he's a few blocks away up the hill, up at the house. And, and the man said, I must talk to your son. I must talk to him before he goes to India. So he came up to the house. And um, the main thing that he told me, he said, when you go to India, he said, you must go to Kashmir. He said, you must go to Kashmir. He said, Kashmir is like Shangri-La. It's like another planet. Kashmir is like a, a fantastic, beautiful, otherworldly place. And he said, you must promise me that you'll go to Kashmir. And I said, okay, I'll go to Kashmir. So what happened, the opening chapter of my book it's meant to be a little bit irreverent. Irreverent, a very strange bottle of beer, a connection with Jesus in India. And I like this quote by Krishnamurti. Whenever a human being sets out to find the real truth about something, he must first arm himself with great courage because he may not find what he is expecting. <laughs> so what happened? What happened was that, uh, how can I say it? Afghanistan was a difficult, and is, a difficult place for uh, a Westerner to be, to be working and spending time. And very strict, very strict, very um, harsh Islamic uh, culture. And so what happened was that, that the, about the only place you'd go to uh, get a drink, to get a beer, was over to the American Embassy Annex. There was a small bar in the American Embassy Annex, and the bartender there was a Pakistani Christian. Pakistani Christians have to take Christian names. His name was Mr. Wilson. And so he wore it. He wore a, a, a turban, wore a turban in the Pakistani outfit. He'd say, he'd say hello, Saib, how are Saib today? I'm fine, you know, like that. Anyway, that, uh, what happened one day there uh, at the American Embassy Annex that I saw, I saw that critter right there, uh, London Lager, and at that time the label said Murray Beer, the way I rem remember. 
But the brewery, I'll take this off here. The brewery is in Rawalpindi. The brewery is in Rawalpindi there in Pakistan. And what happened with, uh, with Mr. Wilson, the, uh, the bartender, it was kind of kind of a quiet time or thin in the, in the uh, bar. And so I asked Mr. Uh, Mr. Wilson, I said, uh, I saw the name, I saw the name Murray and, and you see where I was at Kabul in Afghanistan. And over here is Raul Pindi in Northern Pakistan. And I said to, I said to Mr. Wilson, uh, is that name Murray, Murray Brewery? I said, is Murray named after an Englishman? And he said, no, Sai Murray is named after Mary. And I said, oh, Mary was an English woman. He said, no, Sai Mary is mother of Jesus. And, and I said, I said, why would a, why would a Pakistani beer be named after the mother of Jesus? Pakistan, Pakistan's a Muslim country. And he said, he said, because name Murray from Mary comes because of town near Rawalpindi in, in mountains. There is tomb of Mary, grave of Mary. I said, Mary, the mother of Jesus Christ, is buried in northern Pakistan? <laughs> and I, and I, he said, most assuredly, I've been there numerous times to the grave. Been a holy place the last 2,000 years. And Muslims revere Mary. He was explaining. He had to take care of another customer. And so I, I had another drink. And sat down, <laughs> and and that really threw me for a loop. I mean, I wasn't what I wanted to find. That uh, we'll go on from here. What happened? That it was okay with me that Jesus had been in India as a teenager and a young uh, young man. That was fine with me. But uh, I wanted him dead on the cross. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was raised as a fundamentalist Christian. I wanted him dead, and then up in the right at the right hand of God. Uh, this is something briefly right here. Memories of the British Raj has arrived pitifully in Pakistan at the Murray Brewery, Rawalpindi, and it goes on like that. And then there's, uh, there's, there's a label over there again. We'll go on from here to, this is the tomb of Mary, mother of Jesus in Murray, Pakistan. So this is in northern Pakistan in the Himalayan foothills. And just briefly what Mr. Wilson told me that time, he briefly explained that, that some people believe that Jesus survived the crucifixion and incidentally, that's what it says in the, in the Holy Koran, uh, and that he was in a state of near death. He survived the crucifixion, and that he later, after he recuperated, he returned to India, where he had spent his youth, and along the way, in what's now northern Pakistan, that is, his mother, Mary, became uh, very ill, and it was her time to pass on. And of course, Jesus had great healing powers, but it was time for her to pass on. So she died and was buried there, and, and her tomb uh, ever since then was always, has always been revered and still is. The, here's a more modern picture of the tomb of Mary in Murray, Pakistan. And this is the book by Elizabeth Clare Prophet that I found early on in my research, The Lost Years of Jesus. And that photo is a, I mean, I'm sorry, that, that uh, uh, painting is a painting of young Jesus on his way um, westward through western Tibet and in Ladakh in northwestern India. And this is the art of Nicholas Rorick. And uh, Nicholas Rorick was a, a Russian explorer and an artist, wonderful painter, and he painted hundreds of, of gorgeous Himalayan scenes, marvelous Himalayan scenes. And incidentally, that I mentioned in my book that uh, there's a Nicholas Rorick Museum in New York City. Every time I'm in New York City, I, I go over there to the Nicholas Rorick Museum. They have hundreds of his beautiful Himalayan paintings. And I'll show you what uh, some of them look like. This is uh, Mount of Five Treasures, Kanchenjunga. This is in uh, uh, eastern Nepal. It's another Himalayan scene. I don't know if that shows up too well, but uh, there's a, a rock here with uh, Tibetan writing. Steed of Good Fortune, Lay in Ladakh. And we'll talk about, about Lay in a little while. This was a place where young Jesus uh, spent some time This is the unknown life of Jesus Christ. The, the bottom may be cut off a little bit. If we could raise the projector up just a tad, maybe we could get the bottom of, of uh, some of these. That This is by Nicholas Notovich. Nicholas Notovich was another Russian explorer and traveler. And in, in 1887, there we go, Nicholas Notovich, uh, Nicholas Notovich was traveling in northwestern India. And uh, he, like Nicholas Rorick, traveled for years in that area, Central Asia. And as, he, as Nicholas Rorick was in um, northwestern India, he was thrown from a horse 
and his leg was fractured, and he was taken to the nearby um, Buddhist monastery, Tibetan Buddhist monastery at um, Himis Gompa. Himis Gompa is a monastery which is close to Lay that we just mentioned. And it was while he was recuperating at the monastery, this is Nicholas Notovich, it was while he was recuperating for weeks and weeks at the monastery, he became friends with the, the uh, Buddhist monks and they trusted him after some time. And what they did was they said, um, they said, uh, by the way, we have a 2,000 year old, a 2000 year old document here which tells about young Jesus in India. Would you like to see it? It's like, wow, yes. And so they showed him the document in Tibetan, and the document um, uh, was translated for him. And the document basically said very similar things to the Aquarian Gospel book, that I, Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, that book that I just mentioned, mentions the same places such as the Jagannath Temple that Jesus studied for about six years at the Jagannath Temple in the state of Orissa in eastern India, that he was at the cities of Puri and Cuttack also, that he was, ah, here we go, oh, this just tells a little bit, uh, an unfortunate accident whereby my leg was fractured for it's a totally unexpected pretext to enter the monastery. Excellent care and nursing, and he goes on, uh, manuscripts relating to Christ. And entertaining no doubt of the authenticity of this narrative written with the utmost precision by Brahmin historians and Buddhists of India and Nepal, my intention was to publish the translation on my return to Europe, uh, which he did. But he met with considerable, this is the document, the life of St. Isa, the best of the sons of men. And, and Isa is the way that, that um, uh, Hindus and, and Muslims refer to Jesus. They call him Isa. We'll talk in a bit, we'll talk about the name Emmanuel, which I believe, and the Talmud of Emmanuel explains, that was the, the name, his true name, the name that he was known by during his lifetime was actually Emmanuel. And, but let's take a look at this, that it starts out telling about the, um, uh, that uh, this is telling about the events of the crucifixion and so on. And this concerns, let's go on to the next one here. Yes, this names some of the places, uh, let's see, Northern Sindh, country of the five rivers, that's the Punjab, the five rivers, Panchab, Punjab, and the Rajputan, worshippers of the god Jain, those are Jains, that's one of the uh, lesser, one of the minor religions in India. Uh, left the misguided admirers of Jain and visited Juggernaut in the province of Orsis, that's Orissa, and Juggernaut, or it's also called Jagannath, that's where we get the, the word rolling like a juggernaut, you've heard that expression, that once a year at one of the big Hindu celebrations, they have a big float uh, type of a device, and they have it on, on wooden rollers, and they roll it from the Jagannath Temple down to the uh, eastward to the ocean. And the, the story, the, the myth that kind of built up was that the device, this, this rolling float, it doesn't stop for anything, rolling like a juggernaut, and it goes all the way to the ocean. Uh, and the, let's see, down here, read and understand the Vedas to heal by prayer, and then we go down here, he spent six years in juggernaut, Rajagriha, Benares, it's now called Varanasi, that's on the, um, on the Ganges River, the other holy cities. Isa lived in peace with the Vaishyas and the Sudras, to whom he taught the holy scripture. But the Brahmins and the Kathriyas, and it goes on, the Brahmins and, and Kathriyas did not like the way that, that Jesus taught equality, that all humans are equal. And these classes, the Brahmins were, are the priests, the Kathriyas are the warriors, and then these two classes, the, the Vaishyas and the Sudras, the Vaishyas are the merchants and the Sudras are the, the poor farmers, the majority of the people. And this was in 1922, Swami Abhedananda. Swami Abhedananda had read the Life of St. Isa manuscript, which was discovered by, by uh, Nicholas Notovich in 1887. So Swami Abhedananda read about that and he can, uh, he can read and write um, Tibetan language and Sanskrit and so on. And so he made a trip in 1922 to that same place in northwestern India, to the Himis Gompa Monastery. And he was there and speaking with the monks, got to know them. They trusted him right away, and they showed him the life of St. Isa, the best of the sons of men, the Tibetan document. And he held it in his hands and could read it and translate it himself. And then he wrote this book journey into Kashmir and Tibet, and he verified that it was real and that it was a, a 2,000 year old, it was an ancient document. This is the Himis Gompa Monastery 
by the way, it's, and there's an interesting story I'll, I'll tell about in just a little bit, that, um, uh, that Aziz Kashmiri, Aziz Kashmiri, a uh, newspaper editor in, in Srinagar, in Kashmir, and I'll go ahead and get on to that. But what happened was that, that when Aziz Kashmiri was here in 1965, that the, he was with a group of about five other journalists from other parts of India, and they were given permission to go into this area uh, that were, they would not normally be allowed to go. They went to the Himaskompa Monastery, and while they were here, that down here in the basement part of the monastery, there are the archives, which are more than 2,000 years old. The archives, the head abbot, the head abbot here at the monastery had died, and the new abbot had not been chosen yet. And so there's a time frame of about two or three weeks where that, according to their tradition, between abbots, when one abbot dies, they allow the archives to be opened until the new abbot is elected, and then the archi archives are closed again. And what happened, that, that he happened to be there between the abbots, and, uh, and what happened was that the, the um, uh, lama who was showing them around in the archives was showing them, this, by the way, is what a Tibetan book looks like. The pages are loose leaf pages that way, and the, they have, they're bound and so on like that. So that's what a, a Tibetan book looks like. And this valley right here, this is uh, in Ladakh, right in that area uh, near Himaskompa. And let's see. And this, what happened was that when I went to uh, India, I had two months to travel around in India, and when I was in India, that I went to uh, Kashmir. At that time, there was a lot of tourism, not only foreign people, but many people from other parts of India, that it was a kind of inexpensive vacation, they'd go up to Kashmir. And what happened was that, that I stayed on a houseboat. There are several hundred houseboats here in Kashmir. And so what happened was that I, I uh, got up the next morning and I went to, I uh, found a taxi driver and I said, I would like to find a bookstore that has books in English, some, some books in English, and uh, especially spiritual books. And he said, I know just such a place. And, and, he, and I, said, I said, how much does it cost to get over there? And he said, 15 rupees. And I said, 10 rupees. How about 12? Okay, let's go. So we got over there to the bookstore and there's an, it was an, an old kind of a bookstore. Ceiling fans were creaking. No other customers in there. The uh, gentleman, uh, the owner, he uh, had a necktie and he was drinking a cup of tea and reading a book. And so I said namaste and it went on in. And up right at the front part of the bookstore to one side, there, was, there were a bunch of these yellow books, Christ in Kashmir. I thought, wow, this is, this is amazing. I thought, this is just the kind of thing that I wanted to research here. And I saw the name Aziz Kashmiri, and he's the editor of a newspaper there called the Roshni, the Light. And so what happened, I said to the bookstore owner, I picked up the book to buy it, and I said to the bookstore owner, do, do you know Aziz Kashmiri? He said, oh yes, he's a good friend of mine. And I said, do you think I could possibly meet him and interview him? He said, let's give him a phone call, we'll see. So we called him up on the phone and they spoke in, in Kashmiri for a while, then he handed me the phone, and I, I said, I'm an American, I'm traveling here, I am keenly interested in the subject of, of Jesus in India. And he said, he said, I have been researching that subject all of my adult life, all of my adult life, around 30 years or more. And, and I said, could I meet with you sometime? He said, how about right now? I just finished a meeting. I said, great, <laughs> like that. So I got the directions from the, the bookstore owner. Same taxi driver was out there, took me up there. And it worked out that I, I talked for more than two hours with Aziz Kashmiri. Here's a picture as he looked back then uh, when I met him. And this is the, the new fifth printing of Christ in Kashmir. It's a beautiful book. Here is Aziz Kashmiri now. He's 80, 81 years old, and he's uh, active. He still goes to work every day at the newspaper. His son um, works there with him at the newspaper. Uh, and Aziz Kashmiri uh, showed me in his office there, a very memorable place. There was one window facing, or one wall that was full of, of windows facing to the north, facing toward the snow-capped Himalayas. And it was a very uh, interesting um, discussion we had. There was a bookshelf that he had that was about this wide and about this high, and it was full of books. Every book in there was about Jesus in India. That about half the books were in English, the other half were in uh, Hindi and other languages published there. Many of them published in India, but he had uh, many rare and uh, hard to find books about the subject of Jesus in India. And um, 
Uh, and one of the things that he told me that I, uh, I was, I was kind of young and stupid back then. I used to say the truth a lot. And, and, and I or used to be very directly honest. And so, so we had, he was telling me how that this, he said, he said, for all of my adult life, since I have been a teenager, this has been my, my hobby. Jesus in India has been my hobby like that. And I said, I don't mean to, ins- I don't mean to offend you, but looking at your material and everything you've researched and done, it looks to me more like an obsession than a hobby. And I th- said, I think that's great, but why is it an obsession for you? And he walked over to the beautiful windows and stood there looking at the Himalayas for about two or three minutes. And I, I walked over nearby at the window, and I just looked out there too, and I knew he had heard my question. So we just looked out the window at the Himalayas for about two or three minutes and didn't say anything. And then he turned toward me, and he, he smiled, and he said, I have my reasons. And I did not know until... Years after that, I was reading Jim Deardorff's wonderful book, Celestial Teachings. Celestial Teachings is a, a verse-by-verse comparison of the verses in the Talmud of Emmanuel with the book of Matthew and with, the, with scholarly comments uh, by biblical scholars and so on. And uh, that in the forward part of uh, Celestial Teachings, that there is the mention of a newspaper editor in Srinagar, Kashmir, northwestern India, a newspaper editor who is a, a biological descendant of Jesus, of Emmanuel. And then it's a holy mother bear. That's, that's Aziz Kashmiri. That's who I met and talked with. Wow, that's, that's why, that's why it, the subject was so important to him. And, this, and, and I mentioned about Aziz Kashmiri, the gentleman we just saw, being uh, telling... The, telling me about being in the Himiskompa Monastery and being in the archives. Well, and what happened also at that time that he was in the archives, the, uh, the flash unit on his camera was broken. And what happened was that, that he was being shown the Lama who was taking them around and they had flashlights. The Lama was showing there were stone, there, he said there were thin stone pallets like that. They were about yay big and they were paintings, there are paintings of, of uh, there were hundreds of them, he said there in the archives, and they were paintings, almost all of them were of uh, Buddhist monks and abbots and so on uh, with shaved heads, and they were sitting in the lotus position, uh, and they had um, uh, maroon colored, um, saffron colored robes, and they were all shaved headed, but there was one that was very different, and that one that was very different was a man with a full beard and a mustache and long hair, and he had a, a what looked like a warm wool cap on. He was wearing the traditional baggy shirt and pants, the peron and tamban, and he had a warm woolen-looking vest on, and he would look robust and, and suntanned and healthy, and he was smiling. And he was sitting there like that, and then so Aziz, so Aziz Kashmiri walked over to that one, and he was shining his, his flashlight, and he was saying, who's this one? What does it say at the bottom? And the priest, the, the monk, went over there and he cleaned off some of the dust on the bottom of it to read the Tibetan writing and he was kind of trying to sound it out and he said it, it's, see, uh, Yeshosh, Yesh, Yeshosh, traveling Hebrew sage and holy man who visited here in the time of abbot so-and-so. And he said, that was about 2,000 years ago. And, and, the, and Aziz Kashmiri said, well, I don't know he said an expletive or not, but anyway, it was like, wow, that is Jesus. This is, a, this is when Jesus was here for about two months on, after he had traveled from India up through what's now Nepal into Tibet and then across through western Tibet. And then he came through that, uh, the valley and he was at Himiskompa Monastery at Leh and then at Srinagar. And he stayed about two months at Himiskompa and he was teaching and doing healings. And they loved him so much that they painted a portrait of him along with the other people they honored. And, but I show this picture of um, men from Afghanistan and you see these, these caps that they're wearing. These are warm wool caps and this design of the caps, it comes from Alexander the Great, uh, they called Sekundar, they call Alexander Sekundar. They still remember him very much that Sekundar and his army of 50,000 um, 
Greek soldiers. They came in 300 B.C. all the way from Macedonia, all the way across uh, to what's now Turkey, uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. But they came all the way into India, and in it, this is a traditional design that the Greek soldiers used for, they would make these woolen warm caps. And the reason I'm showing this is that Aziz Kashmiri told me that, the, that Jesus was wearing one of these. It was apparently cold weather when the portrait was made. He was wearing one of these warm woolen caps. And they still use this design now in uh, northern Pakistan, northwestern India, uh, eastern Afghanistan. You still see those kind of caps. And, and then this is, this is the tomb of Jesus in Srinagar. This is in the, uh, Aziz Kashmiri said, uh, by the way, the tomb of Jesus is here. You want to see it? And I said, sure. <laughs> and and so, uh, so I went over there, uh, same taxi driver, went over there and got over there. And um, uh, he had given me the directions. It's in the Kanyar district, uh, the old city district of Srinagar. And the, the place is called Rozabal, uh, at resting place of the saint. And that uh, went inside, and there was nobody else in there. And inside, there's a stone sarcophagus. And uh, uh, I really had goosebumps uh, being in there. And, and this shows, by the way, this shows, uh, you see the marks in the feet. And the name that, uh, that Jesus, that Emmanuel used after the crucifixion was Yuz Asaf. Yuz Asaf means leader of the cleansed. Yuz Asaf. It also, um, Holger, Holger Kersten, um, thinks that it may be uh, derived from um, bodhisattva, the expression bodhisattva, bodhisattva, an enlightened uh, being, like an avatar. And we'll see some more. Uh, let's see. If did anybody want me to go back to that one? The uh, this one right here, this map, if you can see right here, Murray. There we go. Here's Murray in the in the Himalayan in the Himalayan foothills, right up here. And this is where Mary died, where her tomb is. And then not far over the mountains here, you come into the Vale of Kashmir. Here's Srinagar. There's a place, by the way, right about here, um, 12 miles or so away from Srinagar, called Pahalgam, which means the meadow of the shepherd, Pahalgam. And it's supposed to be that when he first got back here, that he lived for, for maybe two or three years there at Pahalgam in a cottage at that place, a high meadow, and with wonderful springs, wildflowers, wonderful place. And the, by the way, the, the Quran, Holy Quran mentions that, that, uh, Jesus, um, that Jesus and his mother, that when they left the Middle East, that they went to a high country, a high country with springs and flowers. And that fits that description perfectly of that area. And then he lived later, later at Srinagar. And we'll find in the Talmud of Emmanuel that he, the Talmud of Emmanuel relates how in the latter part, information from Billy, Billy Meyer, relates that, uh, that uh, Emmanuel uh, got married at about the age of 45 to a pretty young lady. And the tradition has it that her name was Marianne or Mary, Mari, Marianne or Mary. And we'll see some more information about that later. It could po that could possibly be Mary Magdalene. I don't rule it out. Mary Magdalene may have traveled overland in another caravan and joined him. Maybe they were in love. I think that's great. And then here, she used to be a prostitute, but I think that's great. And here we go, Lay is over here, and here's Hemus Skompa. Here's the Hemus Monastery. That's just a few miles from Lay. And when he was coming from Tibet, when Jesus was coming from Tibet, he could well have come around this way. And we'll. This is Jesus in India. This was written in the 1890s by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Gadian, and Gadian is in right about in that area, western India, close to what's now the Pakistan border. And um, my mother used to say, Ed likes India because he can say those names that white folks can't normally pronounce. <laughs> Haz Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Gadian. And, and he was the leader. He was a, a prophet. Hazrat means prophet. And, and he would, um, uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, uh, put special emphasis on the subject of Jesus in India, and especially after the crucifixion. This is the route that he believed he may have taken up this way and across. 
and across that way. And that uh, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he started a, a movement, you could call it a sect or a movement within Islam uh, call, that, was, that is called the Ahmadiyya Muslim movement. And uh, I showed about Aziz Kashmiri. Aziz Kashmiri is one of the leaders of the Ahmadiyya Muslim movement. There are Ahmadiyya Muslims here in the United States, um, many thousands of them. Uh, there are several million Ahmadiyya Muslims in, in that region of northern Pakistan, northwestern India, and in other parts of the world also. That one of the interesting things I have been asked to, I've spoken several times at Ahmadiyya Muslim conferences. By the way, I don't know if I mentioned, but Billy Meyer, if I'm not mistaken, that Askit, uh, who was Billy's teacher for 11 years, Askit at one point asked Billy to join various different religions, um, the Jewish religion, other religions, and so on. And one of the religions that Billy joined for a while was the Ahmadiyya Muslim reli religion. And um, um, that Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he, at one point in uh, the 1890s, early 1900s, he made a prophecy. He said that 100 years from now, the latter part of the 20th century, there will be, there'll be young people from the West, from America and Europe, who will come to India, and they'll travel around in India, and they will we'll find information that proves that Jesus lived in India, and they will write books about it and give talks about it. And, and that uh, at one of those Ahmadiyya conferences, with a lot of people there, that one of the one of the elders stood up and he told about that prophecy and he pointed at me and he said, here is the fulfillment of prophecy. <laughs> and I, I didn't, I was like, whoa, okay. And, and this is Holger Kersten's book. I may not pronounce the German uh, names the right way, but Holger Kersten wrote, Jesus lived in India, his unknown life before and after the crucifixion. And I, certainly admit it was, it was a hard pill for me to swallow about the survival of the crucifixion. And, oh, yes, I'll show you again. Holger Kersten, K-E-R-S-T-E-N, Holger Kersten. Uh, right, this is, this is in English. It's translated into English, and you can, it's a, a book that's in print, and you can, you can find that either at a local bookstore or they can order it for you. It's in print, um, Holger, Holger Kersten, uh, lives at, I believe, Freib Freiburg, Freiburg in Germany, and uh, teaches, I think, at a theology school. But uh, Holger Kersten is, um, we'll find some more about his research. Let me show you about a website here. Let's see if, uh, there we go. The Tomb of Jesus Christ. This is the photo taken by Holger Kersten, that same photo. And the website, it's very simple, www.tombofjesus.com. And this has research and it, all this information and, and so on, related information that uh, I'm in the vendors area and um, Jim Deerdorf is back there, Wendell's there, um, uh, Mike Whelan, uh, and you know about Mike's book, I'll, I'll hold it up, uh, Wendell held it up earlier. Uh, that, uh, but anyway, I'm over there all week and, and if you would like to follow up on any of this information, I'll, I'll give you uh, um, be happy to give you free information and also I'll be happy to give you a, a business card. At the bottom of my card I've got Jim Deerdorf's website and uh, Jim Deerdorf's website is a marvelous website that has extensive information about the Talmud of Emmanuel and it, it also has dozens and dozens of connecting links to other UFO sites, UFO related sites. It's, it's a wonderful website and he updates it frequently also. Let me just show you that we'll just kind of Oh yeah, here we go. This is uh, Dr. Fida Hasnain, uh, who is, lives there in Srinagar. And Dr. Fida Hasnain is one of the main researchers also about Jesus in India. He wrote A Search for the Historical Jesus, written in 1994. And the reason that I'm showing this right now, we'll go to the next one. I want to show you something about survival of the crucifixion. That this is interesting. This is an account by Flavius Josephus, a famous historian. And this, this is kind of neat. I was sitting by Titus Caesar with Cerealius and a thousand riders to a certain town by the name of Pessoa to find out whether a camp could be set up at this place. On my return, I saw many prisoners who had been crucified and recognized three of them as my former companions. I was inwardly very sad about this and went with tears in my eyes to Titus. That was the, the Roman governor. 
and told him about them. He at once gave the order that they should be taken down and given the best treatment so they could get better. However, two of them died while being attended to by the doctors. The third recovered. In other words, we'll see some more things about crucifixions and, and people surviving crucifixions, uh, especially if their legs are not broken. And we go down to the next part here. This is about uh, Jesus. He eventually married a woman named Marian, who bore him children. And we'll jump on down to the, to the next part. Well, how did that work? Why did he die? Oh, this, he died at about the age of 110 to 110 to, some people believe, may be 120 years. The figure uh, that, that I've heard the most is right in the range of 110 to 115 years, maybe 112 years old, something right in that range. And this, and he incidentally, and the Talmud of Emmanuel relates how that following the crucifixion and following his recovery, uh, that uh, after he had recovered uh, for two years in Damascus, that the 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 life force was more powerful than ever. He was stronger and more vigorous, and more powerful than ever, and the spiritual power was increased also. And that he his life was there was a great deal more travel, and we'll talk about that later. A great deal more travel that he did not just to India, but but uh, very likely that he visited some other places such as Japan, various places in Europe, such as England, and that also America. We'll see some interesting things here in a little bit. I'll kind of, let me show you just quickly about this. The route that going over to India, it may well have been a route like this through Afghanistan, across like this, down here, uh, spending some time with the Jain religion, the Jain people over here, across this way to uh, Jagannath, eastern India, state of Orissa, uh, and then down to Madras, and then up here this way, Rajagriha, over to Benares, now called Varanasi. There's a Hindu healing school here where he uh, spent time. And there's an interesting story about eye surgery. They, they, there are accounts that even 2,000 years ago they did eye surgeries here with obsidian blades and that, and that Jesus may have studied with them. They had something to deaden the eyes and to cut out cataracts with obsidian blades. And then up here, Kapilavastu, birthplace of the Buddha, that uh, Jesus was there. He was there at Lhasa, and he may have met and studied with a, uh, a great sage named Ming Sti, or Mincius, and then later traveled by Mount Kailas, a sacred mountain in western Tibet, up here at the Himaskompa Monastery in Leh, over here to Srinagar, and then, and then back, and back returning through southern Afghanistan, uh, southern Iran, and across, and across this way, and, and back, and that he may well have been in his early 20s, maybe around 23, 24 years old, when he returned back to Jerusalem. And that this is a wonderful book by Janet Bach, uh, The Jesus Mystery of Lost Years and Unknown Travels. This um, is a wonderful book, and Janet Bach is a, a devotee of Sai Baba. This, and we'll talk more incidentally, Sai Baba, for those of you who know him, uh, that uh, Sai Baba confirmed through his own spiritual means, his own spiritual insight, Sai Baba has confirmed that Jesus did live in India, and that is true. And Paramahansa Yogananda, for those of you who know who he, who he was, that Paramahansa Yogananda also confirmed that Jesus lived in India. This is the inside of the Jagannath Temple there in eastern India, where young Jesus spent about six years. This is Sai Baba, and as I mentioned, Sai Baba confirmed that, that Jesus lived in India. Uh, I've only, I'm not a devotee myself of Sai Baba, but I've only heard good things about him. And let's see. This is Celestial Teachings. This is just a uh, black and white um, Xerox that um, a radio interviewer uh, borrowed my copy and lost it. But anyway, it's, it's a wonderful book. It's by Jim Deardorff. And Soul Samples by Leo Sprinkle. Many of you know Leo. Leo's a wonderful individual. And here's a photo of Leo. And incidentally, his, um, his uh, office phone number, uh, mailing address, it's in the back of my book in the resources section. Leo wrote the forward for my, for my book. And also that if you want, uh, that Leo, if you ask him to, he can do a higher self-reading. He can, like Edgar Casey, he can go into a self-trance and speaking from the higher self, he can give you a reading. He, he can do that over the telephone without ever having met him if you like. And the readings are, are I have found very accurate and very helpful, and uh, they step on toes too. They don't. He doesn't mince any words. This is a, a photo of that. Uh, this here is Barbara Lamb, 
here's Barbara, here's Helen Billings, George Cruz, and myself. And this was one time up at Laramie, the Rocky Mountain UFO Conference. And, uh, and I'm showing this because, because the four of us, we believe that we've had many lifetimes together. And we asked Leo about three years or so ago, we asked Leo to, to do a higher self reading. And what came out in the reading was that, uh, that he said, we've had numerous lifetimes together, especially military related lifetimes as soldiers. We were Roman soldiers together in one lifetime. We were Greek soldiers in another lifetime. In fact, we had this interesting death one time. We were up at the top of the hill and we were being overwhelmed by the enemy. And, uh, but anyway, incidentally, <laughs> we got overwhelmed. You know, uh, that I was one of the first ones to die. You know, I was pretty enthusiastic. And George had better sense. You know, he's, anyway, George uh, was one of the latter ones. But anyway, the four of us got killed. But it was an interesting. You know, it's like, see you in the next lifetime, you know? But uh, the reason I show this and, and mention about this is that Leo mentioned, he said, one of your most recent past lifetimes was as British soldiers in India. He said, in the 1800s, the four of us were British soldiers stationed in India. And he said, the remarkable thing about us in that lifetime, he said, the remarkable thing was that we were respectful of the culture and spirituality of the people in India uh, in contrast to, to the way some British soldiers behaved. He said that we were... Uh, respectful of the, the culture. And uh, incidentally, that, that Barbara and Helen are here all week. They are um, professional counselors. They, uh, uh, if you want an excellent counselor, counselor see, see Barbara or see Helen. And uh, also have their, uh, they do counseling, for example, about UFO missing time uh, experiences, um, past life uh, research, and, and so on. And George was not able to, to make it to the, the meeting this time. He's busy with work. And here's Light Years. This is how I first found out about the Billy Meyer case in about 1986. I read a review of this in uh, uh, Lucia Sferish, a uh, wonderful uh, UFO news clipping service that's a, a monthly uh, news clipping. Uh, it's a compilation of newspaper articles and, and so on uh, that uh, everything, anything related about UFOs. And I read a book review of Light Years by Gary Kinder about the Billy Meyer case. And the, the reviewer basically was kind of acting like a horse's rear end. The reviewer was saying, well, if Pleiadians were visiting us, they'd visit me because I've got a better education than Billy. And that, you know, that reviewer, was, reviewer was acting like that, I mean, writing like that. And I, I, thought, I thought, well, why don't I get the book and read it and I'll make up my own mind. And, and then that was, and I researched and followed with, with many materials after that. And, and there's a, and incidentally about, and there's Billy. That was some years ago, maybe about 20 years ago. Here's a wonderful painting by James Nichols of Arizona. He does these wonderful UFO paintings. This is a painting of, of Sinyasi and her beam ship and the landing pods down, down there. And, um, and it was rare that, that the Pleiadians would land their beam ship that way. And uh, normally they would either hover it above the ground or in many cases, when they make a contact with Billy, they would beam Billy up. That is, dematerialize him, bring him up when he was in a, a peaceful uh, time. And here's Issa Rashid. Now, the Issa Rashid in the 1960s, Issa Rashid was, a, was an uh, uh, ex-priest. His mother was Greek. His father was Palestinian. And Issa Rashid, um, he uh, could read and translate Aramaic the language of Jesus very well. What happened, uh, and Issa Rashid was a, uh, in telepathic communication with the Pleiadians, the Talmud of, of Emmanuel, uh, this document, Billy Meyer and Issa Rashid, I'll show you right here. This is, the, this is a photo by Michael Hessman, and this is a, a photo of the, the Hinnom Valley. This is the, the old city of Jerusalem. This is the south side of the old city of Jerusalem. There's the Hinnom Valley here the Kidron Valley over here, and we'll see some more Jerusalem things in a little bit. But what, um, what Billy Meyer and Issa Rashid in 1963, the Pleiadians, uh, or I should say actually Ascot, uh, Ascot uh, directed them to go to this place in the Hinnom Valley and right about here that they would find the real tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And so they went to the Hinnom Valley, they went to this place, and about part way up, you know, it's either... Uh, that is, Michael Hessman was talking on a cell phone at the time that he took this, as I understand, and Billy was directing him that it was either this place or a secondary possibility could have been right about in there. But that 
what happened was that they found this a drawing by Billy, uh, and this is incidentally on Jim Deardorff's website, that uh, this is Meyer's recollection, and it's been labeled in English. This was the front entrance to the tomb, and, and this was the tomb that was made for Joseph of Arimathea to be buried in, and the length you see, it may have been about only about four meters in length that way. The secret of the tomb, which the Talmud of Emmanuel relates, the secret of the tomb was that it had two entrances. It had the front main entrance where the big stone could be rolled, but then around the corner, around the side, it had this back tunnel entrance that a person could crawl in and out of. It was a secret entrance. And so that was the secret of the tomb. So what happened in 1963, Billy Meyer and Issa Rashid, they were looking up the side of the Hinnom Valley. They found a about a one-foot diameter hole they could see, and Billy said that beside it there was a Merami bush growing beside it. They went up there, climbed up there to it, and they enlarged the hole, and then they found they could crawl in there. They used their flashlights, enlarged the hole. They used their flashlights, went back, and they came into this, this dark, bigger area, and there were stones, as I understand it. The, the floor was a, a series of flat stones, and Ascot had directed them to go to a certain place that was not in the main way, but like to one side, perhaps, and that to pick up a certain large flat stone, and under that, they would find the 2,000-year-old document, which was written in Aramaic, and it was on scrolls. The scrolls were apparently um, in a roll. They were, they were in preservative resin. Some of the accounts are that they were in some kind of a box, such as a crystal box with a lid, and they were underneath one of the flat stones. So, so Billy and Issa Rashid uh, took the Talmud of Emmanuel scrolls out, and then they, they Ascot was waiting for them. Ascot was parked in her ship. Uh, as I understand, she was near the Mount of Olives, or right in that area, and she had a cloaking device that is an invisibility shield around her ship, like something that would bend light so you can't see her ship. So Ascot was waiting. They, they, on the way over to Ascot's ship, they dropped by an antiquity shop, a place which specializes in uh, uh, antiquities like the... Uh, that was translating, I think they were working with Dead Sea Scrolls. And Billy and Issa Rashid, they showed the, um, they showed the scrolls, and the uh, antiquity shop um, people said, said, leave them here. We want to keep them for a while. Leave them here with us. And Billy and Issa Rashid said, no, they're not, staying, they're not staying with anybody else. They're staying with us. And they took the scrolls. Well, then the antiquity shop people, they lied about it. They called the police, and they said, we've just had some couple of uh, uh, bad guys here who... Uh, stolen antiquities. They, they have some Dead Sea Scrolls or something like that, and you know, come and come and get them. So the police were on the way, and I don't know if they were running or not. But anyway, Billy and Issa Rashid, they got up to Ascot's ship, got into it, and, and they got out of there. But this is this is a, a, a uh, map of of Jerusalem as it may have looked back then. This is the the beautiful gate where Jesus may have may have entered. Uh, that. Um, just a few, sh a few days, a short time before the events of the crucifixion. That's the beautiful gate. Here's the Temple Mount. Here is, this is what would now be the Wailing Wall, that side foundation wall of, of uh, the Temple of, of Herod the Great. And then here's the Antonia, the Roman garrison where there are about 6,000 Roman soldiers. This may have been the place where Pontius Pilate had the trial also. This is called the Via Dolorosa, the Path of Sadness. And Golgotha, we don't know exactly, but Golgotha may have been here. Here's the Hinnom Valley, again, the tomb that, that Billy and Issa Rashid found that, that apparently, and that I believe, is the real tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. It's right here. And if you're interested, incidentally, just briefly, that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is located right about here. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre, that goes back to 325 A.D., uh, Emperor Constantine, uh, that who had converted to Christianity and he had proclaimed that Christianity would be the state religion of the Roman Empire. And Emperor Constantine was here in 325 AD. They spent a number of months and they wanted to find the tomb where Jesus had been. And naturally, no one knew where it was. And so what happened was that mysteriously a, an inscription was found was when Emperor Constantine was really getting mad. Find that tomb. I want the tomb of Jesus. And then, and then ah, miraculously, an inscription appeared above an, by an empty tomb, and Emperor Constantine said, this is it. Build the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and let's go home, like that. So that's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I don't believe it's the real 
tomb of Jesus. And another, there's another possibility. There's a, a place called the, um, we'll see a picture later, a place called the, uh, yeah, here's a picture of modern Jerusalem. There's the beautiful gate. Here's the wailing wall. And here's uh, what may be Golgotha and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And over in this direction to the south, this will be up to the north, over in this direction to the south, outside of the city walls, is the um, uh, Hinnom Valley and where Billy and, and Isa were, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And why Jesus was killed, uh, U.S. News and World Report, and this is the real thing. This is in the Philippines. This is a, a man, uh, as I understand, several people do this every year in the Philippines around Christmas. Uh, as a form of, of penance, they ask or they insist on being crucified with nails, the real thing. And there are people standing here in the background. This the, is a photo from the magazine. I was not there. But, but if you, you can see the nail, by the way, the shape of the nail, it's, it's a, a, a square nail, not a round mill nail, but a square nail. And that uh, the point of the story being that, that with these crucifixions, uh, that um, people, and normally people survive. It's, a, of course, a horrible ordeal. But, uh, and I did more research about crucifixions than, than I ever thought I would or ever wanted to. But about crucifixions, uh, that there's a lot of details. I talked to two medical doctor friends of mine, talked to one friend, rec medical doctor friend of mine, we talked for more than an hour recently about crucifixions about how the, the death takes place by a slow asphyxiation, kind of a suffocation, and that the crucifixion, uh, it's, it hap the death comes much more quickly if the legs are broken. If the legs are broken, the individual is not able to push himself up to keep breathing enough to, to stop the, uh, the carbon dioxide buildup. Uh, but the point of this, and there's also, the, it's possible that there are could have been a, a wooden platform for the feet to be on. There's also some crucifixions had a kind of a wooden dowel that would go between the between the, the legs. The individual could kind of sit on that wooden dowel. There were various different ways. Some people were not crucified with nails, but um, in the case of, of Emmanuel, they, they wanted to be especially cruel about it and, and using nails. But the point of the story being many people I'd say most people in that case in the Philippines live through the crucifixion experience. Here's the garden tomb in, um, uh, in Jerusalem. And this is a Talmud of Emmanuel. This is the first printing back in, this is in 1992, first edition. And it was published by Wildflower Press. And that, uh, let me see, that, um, clear translation in English and German on the left-hand pages, left-hand pages is... Um, uh, you have the German on the right hand, you have the English, and let's see, let's just kind of go quickly to, there's a, the second printing, 1994, the original book of Matthew. This is, this is the more recent printing, and then just as of yesterday, we have the, the most updated printing, and the next speaker, Dr. Jim Deerdorf, will, will tell you in um, great detail about the... Um, the aspects of the uh, the new revised updated printing and the speaker after that, uh, Dr. Dietmar Rote, will be uh, talking about many of the, the implications and the teachings in the Talmud of Emmanuel. Uh, there is a mention, and I'll see if I can get to it here, I'll kind of try to go quickly with some things, that there's a mention that Pleiadians made in the book one of the Billy Meyer contact notes, the Pleiadians made the mention, and I'll see if I have time to show the, the page on here, but the, the Pleiadians said, in effect, or that a sannyasi said, in effect, that the Talmud of Emmanuel may be the most important book that an earth human can own and read. The, Tal the Talmud of Emmanuel, that it is a tremendously important and, and significant book. And I love to read the Talmud of Emmanuel. It's, it's just like spiritual candy for me. I love to read it. But uh, this is the passage about uh, Emmanuel walking on the, on the sea. And it, it goes on there that uh, middle of the sea being battered by the waves, the wind was contrary, a storm was over them. During the fourth night watch, Emmanuel came towards them, walking on the water of the sea. And the disciples were terrified. They said, he's a ghost. They were screaming with fear. Uh, soon Emmanuel came nearer, spoke, spoke to them, and said, be comforted. It is I. Do not be afraid. Master, is it you? Peter asked. Truly, it is I, said Emmanuel. And then you know how the rest of the passage uh, goes. And down here, 
Come here to me and don't be afraid. Understand and know that the water is carrying you and it shall carry you. Do not doubt your knowledge and ability and the water will be a firm foundation. And then Peter came toward them, but uh, strong thunder ripped through the howling storm. He was startled and began to sink, screaming, Emmanuel, help me. Emmanuel quickly went to him, stretched out his hand and grabbed him, saying, Oh, you of little knowledge. And he was basically telling him, you were doing fine, then you doubted. Why did you doubt? And, and then let's see right here. The, uh, oh, and here, this is significant. May Emmanuel is saying, however, I will not be killed, but being in a state of near death, or I think specifically in the German, half dead. I'll be in a state of near death. I will be considered dead for three days and nights. I will be placed in a rock tomb so that the sign of Jonah will be fulfilled. And, of course, the sign of Jonah, Jonah went into, was taken into the mouth of the great fish, which may have been a whale, it's the name of my small publishing business, Jonah Publishing. I like Jonah. Jesus. Anyway, uh, my friends from far away India who are well versed in the art of healing will be my caretakers and help me flee from the tomb on the third day. They went in through that back tunnel entrance so that I will then finish my mission with people of India. It will happen that I will attain a certain insight, increase my knowledge, and bring about a new strength in spirit and consciousness. Uh, oh, this is oh, the prophecy. Whoa, this is cracking good. This is, whoa. You can see why the Israelis were so furious about, you can see why that Isa Rashid and his whole family were hunted down and killed. Even the children were killed. This is one of the passages that, let's look at this. The, is, the Israelites trespassed against life and truth, and they built this city on the blood of people. And then it goes on down here. The Israelites have plundered this land through rapaciousness and murder. They have killed their friends with whom they had drunk wine, and they have deceived and misled their fellow believers of the Jewish cult who are truly not Israelites but only are cult believers. Uh, thus the Israelites betrayed their own friends and murdered them because of their greed. But it will likewise happen to them on the part of the rightful owners of this land whom they have deprived of their rights and subjugated since ancient times. And it goes down here, Emmanuel says, 2,000 and more years will pass, but in the meantime Israel will never find peace because many wars and much evil threaten the unlawful owners of this land. And there are other passages like that where, woof, that Emmanuel is really telling it like it is. This is before Pilate. I like this passage a lot. That um, it uh, goes on here, Pilate, the governor, who asked him, are you Emmanuel, whom they call the king of wisdom? You have said it. That is what I am called by the people. And Pilate asked, it is also said that you were begotten by the angel Gabriel, who is an angel of God. Emmanuel said, you have said it. Pilate inquired once again, saying, let us hear your wisdom, because your teaching is new to me. Emmanuel replied, behold, eons ago I returned from the realm of the higher world in order to fulfill a difficult task. And now I was begotten by a celestial son to be a prophet in this life. It happened according to destiny and the desire of God, the ruler over the human races of earth that were created by him. And it's a wonderful passage. Let's just jump on. We're gonna, I'm going to conclude in just a little bit. This is part of the prophecy. Love will grow cold in many people because ignorance will take over. Hatred will rule all over the world and evil will reign. But those who persist in the truth will survive. This lesson will be preached in the new age throughout the world as testimony for all peoples, and then the end will come. And then this, this is, this is like, see if this rings a bell. They will build machines made of metal, made from metal for use in the air, on the water, and on land to kill off one another. They will throw heavy projectiles out of these machines made of metal across the land and the cities. And fire will come out of these projectiles and burn the world so that not much will be spared. They will put the cornerstones of life and deadly air into the projectiles to kindle the deadly fire and destroy land and life. And then it goes on, since the human races will at that time comprise far more than 10 times 500 million people. Now there's more than 5 billion people as it is now. Great parts of them will be eradicated and killed. This is what the law ordains because people have violated it and will violate it again into the distant future. And the, the passage goes on. And in Gethsemane, and this is about in Gethsemane, the night of the betrayal, when, of course, Judas Iscariot, the scribe, who was not the betrayer, uh, was the only one who was staying awake. It goes on to the next page. The others, all the other disciples fell asleep. Judas Iscariot, who was not the betrayer, stayed awake with Emmanuel and helped him in that time of suffering. And then, and then right here, oh, this is good. Whoa, with, with Simeon. Whoa. Emmanuel answered, saying, truly I say to you, you may succeed for a long time in accusing Judas Iscariot of treason in front of the people, but the truth will come out and be known by all in the whole world, namely, that my traitor is not Judas Iscariot, but is your son, Judah Iheriot, 
who bears the name of his father, the Pharisee. Simeon the Pharisee was furious, stepped up and hit Emmanuel in the face with his fist because he was afraid of his true words. And then it goes on before Caiaphas and the other events. And, and this is at the crucifixion. They were all astonished because it was unusual for those crucified to die so quickly. It goes on here, Joseph of Arimathea. Um, after a little while, he noticed that Emmanuel was only half dead, but he told no one. And then Joseph of Arimathea quickly got permission from Pilate to have the body taken down and put into his own tomb. And uh, then Joseph of Arimathea sought out Emmanuel's friends from India, went back with them to the tomb. They went in through a secret second entrance unknown to the henchmen, to the soldiers, nursed him for three days and three nights so that he was soon in better health again and his strength was restored. And it goes on, that, and this is about the guards. Pilate said to them, take my soldiers as guardians, go and watch the tomb as well as you can. But they did not know the secret of the grave, namely that it had two exits and entrances so that Emmanuel's helpers could, without being seen, go to him to apply healing salves and herbs so that on the third day he was again strong enough to walk. And, oh yeah, we go, it's time for the next tray here, but we're almost at the end here. Uh, there's a, um, there's a wonderful passage uh, that, uh, that is concerning, um, uh, concerning Gabriel, concerning the biological father, and that um, uh, the passage in the Talmud of Emmanuel is about how that at the tomb that night uh, that um, a beam ship came down. There was a thundering sound, and the beam ship came and landed. A celestial sun came out, and it says in the Talmud of Emmanuel, the soldiers got out of his way because they feared him. It's like he was perhaps, his clothing was perhaps glowing or, or um, shining, and he just walked toward the big stone in the front, and the soldiers got out of his way quickly, and then, and then it, the passage is there. It's like something Mark Bean would do. They, it gives the account how, that, how that this celestial son, he pointed his hands at the soldiers one after another, and lightning bolts came out and zapped them and knocked them down, and they were paralyzed. And uh, let's see if you can... And this great thunder, a guardian angel came out of the light. His appearance was like lightning. His garment was white as snow. Went to the tomb. The soldiers got out of his way because they feared him. It's like, it's like he didn't, it's like, hey, I'm going, to, going over here. It's like he wasn't afraid about anything. And the soldiers got out of his way. He lifted his hand from which came bright lightning that hit the soldiers one after the other. And they fell to the ground and did not stir for a long time. That, um, and that could be, you know, Mark Bean in Las Vegas, he does the thing where he can rig up the actors and so on with wires. And they got big electric, whoop charger things and uh, and he you know zap people like a lightning bolt thing 25 or 30 feet and um, uh, so anyway maybe it was something like that maybe the lightning was purely produced by spiritual power uh, either way it's okay with me and and then let's see and let's see oh anyway there there's more of these things about Mary Magdalene uh, and the Guardian angel said, don't touch me because I am of a kind different than you and my garment is a protection against this world. If you touch me, you will die and be consumed by fire. And he goes on. This is just the conclusion here that, that Emmanuel with his mother Mary, this was after uh, recuperating uh, at a safe place, safe house in Damascus, recuperating for two years after the crucifixion. With, and then with his mother Mary, his brother Thomas, and his disciple Judas Iscariot, Emmanuel traveled to northern India. And then they went through many hardships. In today's West Pakistan, high up in the north, the last branches of the western Himalayas, his mother became very sick and died when Emmanuel was about 38 years old. And it goes on, Emmanuel continued. When Emmanuel was about 45 years old, he married a young and pretty woman who bore him numerous children. Uh, settled down like a normal head of a family, today's Srinagar, Kashmir, India. Undertook numerous trips and continued preaching his new doctrine. Died at the age of between 110 and 115 of natural causes and was buried in Srinagar. Judas Iscariot died at, at about the age at the age of about 90, was buried near Srinagar. Joseph, Emmanuel's firstborn son, continued writing his father's story and left India after Emmanuel's death. After a three years journey, he returned to the land of his father to Israel and lived in Jerusalem until his death. From India, he took along the original scrolls, that's the Talmud of Emmanuel scrolls, and hid them in the burial cave in which Emmanuel had lain. That's the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. He considered that place the safest. Uh, and it goes on, these scrolls were found there, 36 chapters of which are rendered here in translation, and then that's by Billy Meyer. And so that's how the Talmud of Emmanuel came to us. So, uh-oh, up here, Mount Kailas in western uh, 
uh, in Western Tibet. I think that I ought to finish in about two minutes or so that I have more material. There's a, a lot of, of material. I've got another uh, tray of, of slides and so on, but I, I think I'd better finish here. And just to show you some briefly, some here's another map of this is one path that Jesus may have taken. The, this route, incidentally, called the Silk Road, that is the, the most famous and most ancient trade route in the world, the Silk Road. And there were thousands of travelers, and have been and still are, travelers who travel this, this Silk Road like this in Afghanistan with camels, horses, and on foot. Uh, nomads were among the earliest traders on the Silk Road. These in modern Afghanistan continue the, the old tradition. So that's the, the Silk Road. This is one of the, it's from 1924. This is a, one of those wonderful paintings by, by Nicholas Rorick. Uh, and um, I've got some of those in Elizabeth Clare Prophet's book. There's quite a few of them reproduced. And if, if you want to see those, they're wonderful, wonderful paintings. Uh, this is a, how after the crucifixion that uh, Emmanuel may have taken that route. Oh, yes, this is real interesting. This is a, the Pleiadians had this 2,000-year-old drawing of Emmanuel, and, uh, uh, and I've also heard that Simyasi herself may have drawn this. And then take a look at this one. This is Billy. Billy, drew, Billy had this drawn in connection with a police artist in Switzerland. That is, the, um, you might need to swallow a little bit to, to fathom it, but in 1957, when Askett was Billy's teacher, that Askett took Billy traveling backwards in time. They went to 32 AD to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Billy got to meet Emmanuel and talk with him for a couple of hours or so uh, at the Garden of Gethsemane. And um, his hair, okay, his hair was a, was a, a, a reddish, uh, reddish brown color. Uh, his eyes were like a, a steel gray or bluish, and he was about around six feet tall, about 170 pounds. And then the last thing here, this is from a cave, and you notice, the, see the nose there? This is from a cave in Illinois. This is an ancient American magazine, Christ in America, question mark. This is in a, a cave. Do you see how the nose looks, the look of the face? This is carved in stone in that cave in Illinois. And then this, and then you look at the nose in this one, there. Do you see it? Okay. So, but anyway, that's the, the conclusion and would, um, would anyone like to have, we can have a question and answer time for five minutes. Would we like to do that? Okay, okay. That's the, the conclusion. Thank you very much, everyone. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> We're going to try to keep this break here to just a couple of minutes because we want to get uh, Jim up here as soon as we can. And this break is going to be only about as long as it's going to take to requeue the tapes. So five minutes maybe, and then we're going to continue rolling.